Michael Meharry serves as the National Communications Director for the Tenth Amendment Center and the Managing Editor of the Schiff Gold website. Michael's the author of four books, including Constitution and Owner's Manual, Our Last Hope, Rediscovering the Lost Path to Liberty. And I saw an article that Michael had written that appeared in Zero Hedge. Title was, Texas Bill Would Create State-Issued Gold-Backed Digital Currency. For those of you who followed Economic War Room, you know this is near and dear to our hearts. This is something we've been working on for the five years this program has existed, and for really 10 years before that when I started working on economic warfare. Because I think we're in an economic war. I think we all agree with that now. But our answer, the Texas solution, is gold, gold, gold as a currency under the Constitution. I want to speak with Michael. I want to reach out to him, and he agreed to come in the Economic War Room. So welcome, Michael, to the Economic War Room. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Excited about what you guys are doing. Well, thank you. Now, you're mentioned with the Tenth Amendment Center. Tenth Amendment mm -hmm. to me is the Constitution. Please explain what that is. Yeah, you know, Thomas Jefferson said that the Tenth Amendment was the cornerstone of the Constitution. Now, unfortunately, today, most people have tossed it in the corner and pretty much ignore it. But it's really – all it is is a rule of construction. It tells us how to read the Constitution. And what it tells us is that any power that is not delegated to the federal government – in other words, if you can't go into the Constitution and see specifically where it says that the federal government has the power to do X, then it can't do X. It's supposed to be left to the states and the people. So most powers were to be left with the states and the people. As James Madison said, the powers – uh, given to the federal government are few and defined, and those which remain with the states and people are numerous and indefinite. Obviously, that's been flipped on its head, and that's part of what we try to do at the Tenth Amendment Center is to teach people what the system is actually supposed to look like and how broken it is. And then second, try to do things to bring it back towards that balance and bring it back to the power residing more in the states and the people as opposed to the monster state in Washington, D.C., well, and one of the most important powers and one that government has wielded throughout human history is the power over money. And we're in the economic war room, and the founders had very specific thoughts on money. Uh, they feared fiat money. They feared mm -hmm. governments that could control people with money. And we're about to see that with central bank digital currencies. Tell us the founders' views on money. Well, I think, that, I think it was Thomas Jefferson that said paper is poverty. And it's not even real money. It's just a shadow of money. And the problem with paper currency, we're seeing it today, is that the government can just fire up the printing press and, and make more when it wants to buy something. Now, of course, it's not literally printing off dollar bills in the basement of the uh, Federal Reserve Building. Uh, it's easier than that in these days. It can just push a button and digitally create money. We're seeing the impact of that every single day. Every time you go to the grocery store, every time you go to the gas station, you are paying what I call the inflation tax. It's a way the government pays for all of this stuff, makes you think it's free, but you're really paying for it. And this is all because of paper currency, because it is so easy to manipulate and, and produce. Gold and silver were always considered the, the foundational money. If you look at the Constitution, it talks about gold and silver. And the reason was simple. It can't be easily manipulated. You can only dig so much gold out of the ground. You can only dig so much silver out of the ground. You can't print gold and silver out of thin air. And so they don't like that. And that's exactly why, starting in the uh, Roosevelt administration, they started to get the United States away from the gold standard because they needed to be able to print more and spend more. I tell people all the time, the Federal Reserve is really the engine that drives what has now become the most powerful and overreaching government in the world. And it does that by being able to handle the uh, money printing. So things like we were talking about with uh, digital currency that is backed by gold issued by the state of Texas, making gold and silver legal tender, creating currency competition. That's something that needs to be done in order to pull this monopoly away from the Federal Reserve and make things uh, more equitable for us. Because really all it's doing is stealing from us, right? We're losing our wealth. We're losing our, uh, our money. Literally, yeah. it's being devalued away. Yeah, no question. And, and first off, it wasn't just the founders that talked about gold and silver. You go to the Bible. From right. the beginning of human history, yes. pretty much, gold and silver has always been money. You'll occasionally see bronze mentioned or copper mentioned, but it's always gold and silver from Genesis to Revelation. And the founders knew that. 
And yet we are printing money, as you said, and there's a monopoly on printing that money. So couldn't we say that it's monopoly money? <laughs> yes, it, it literally is. Uh, it's funny because you'll see some of these countries now, they have the different colors and uh, it, it looks exactly like monopoly money. And that's literally what it is. And it has about that much value. The only thing that makes this fiat money valuable is the fact that people believe in it because the government issues it. And that's the difference between that and commodity money like gold and silver. Gold and silver have intrinsic value beyond their use as money. That's why it became money, because there is value in it. People want it for jewelry. They want it for things uh, other than just having it as money. So there's value intrinsic in it. Paper is paper. Uh, paper is poverty. I love that quote. So yeah, absolutely. And And so I really feel like what we need is to, again, break that monopoly. And the only way to do that is create currency competition. And the only people that can do that uh, at this point are the states. And fortunately, we're seeing states like Texas and others that are starting to take steps to free up gold and silver and return it to its status as money uh, within the state by making it legal tender. Uh, Texas has taken the step of creating its own bullion depository, which is a fantastic step forward. Um, some states are, are still taxing gold and silver, like with uh, sales taxes and income taxes. Those taxes are being removed. So all of these are good, positive steps forward. Yeah, there's no question. And, and, and the nation, because of the power of government and because of the position of America in the world, we've had the reserve currency of the world, which means foreigners would take a $20 bill uh, wherever you went, anywhere in the world, and, and you could buy stuff with it. But that's going away. We're going to have mm -hmm. to take a break in a minute. But when we come back, we'll talk more in depth about that and central bank digital currencies. But to your point, the federal government has abused its power to create money. And because of that, they have uh, put us with this inflation tax. It is an unjust weight and measure, according to the Bible. Uh, so if I work all day and earn a hundred dollar bill and the federal government just prints one, how is that fair? It's not fair. So yeah. uh, all of your points are great. I'm excited to meet you and bring you on board with what we're doing and learn more about what you're doing. We'll take a break. When we come back, we'll talk more about money. We're talking with Michael Meharry, and he picked up on what we're doing here in Texas. Now, he's from the Tenth Amendment Center. He's a constitutional expert. He loves the constitutional. He also understands and loves gold, as you heard in the first segment. Uh, but, Michael, what did you see? How did you see our Texas transactional currency bill, and what in it intrigued you? Well, it's one of the policy areas, sound money, I should say, is one of the policy areas that the Tenth Amendment Center has been involved in for a number of years. Um, and basically, for folks who aren't familiar, you can visit 10thamendmentcenter.com. 10th is all spelled out. And you can kind of see how we work in various issues. And our goal is simply to move the system away from the federal government doing all of these things that it's not constitutionally supposed to be doing. So, you know, we do we deal with like gun control, something that the federal government shouldn't be doing. Uh, 
surveillance. There's all kinds of issues that we're working in. So sound money is just one of those issues. It's one of the areas that the federal government has overstepped its bounds. We should never have a central bank that is that is printing and controlling our currency. So when we saw the, the, the bill in Texas, we knew that this was a good step forward for sound money because it creates another way to pay. Uh, that gets you away from having to use Federal Reserve notes. And it's really all about currency competition. If we have options, people can use the options that are best for them. And the options that are best for them are going to be the ones that preserve their wealth. So, uh, you know, gold and silver, as we've already discussed, are really that kind of sound money. So what we want to do is we want to give people the opportunity to use sound money, which is established in the Constitution. As you say, going all the way back to biblical times, that's really the key of this. That's the value that we see in it. It's a way to create that currency competition to give people an option to escape the devaluation of their currency that they're getting from the Federal Reserve. Uh, so we love this step forward, and, and we look at it um, along with the things that I mentioned earlier that other states are doing, getting rid of taxes on gold and silver, establishing it as legal tender creating bullion depositories at the state level so that the Federal Reserve is not able to monopolize our money. It's just like living in a, uh, a regular uh, you know, commercial environment. We want competition. We want competition in our economies. We don't want a monopoly grocery store. We don't want a monopoly hardware store. We certainly don't want a monopoly bank that uh, unfortunately is destroying our currency. So that's really how it came on our radar. Yeah, well, the problem with uh with optionality is that the federal government can shut down so many options. So people, some people say, I, I like Bitcoin. Oh, I'm right. fine with that. You can like Bitcoin, but they can literally control it. Article 1, Section 10, that 10th Amendment uh, and, and the whole concept gives states this authority. They can make nothing other than gold and silver coin to be tender, but they can right. make gold and silver tender. And yes. what's really key in that is I've looked at the IRS rulings on how they tax Bitcoin. And they can, they can tax it or they can kill it. When they tax it, it's very specific. They say a digital currency that is not tender, which means that we might be able to hold gold and silver in the bullion depository at Texas or any other state. If it's declared tender, we can challenge whether or not the IRS can tax the gains. There really aren't gains in gold and silver. They really right. don't gain. They maintain value. I mean, I looked Correct. at the price of a good man's suit 100 years ago versus today, an ounce of gold would buy one. I looked back, you know, at 1980 to today, the price of gold relative to, to consumer goods. Basically, gold can still buy the same basket of goods and services as, as it did in 1980, but the U.S. dollar can't. It's lost a huge percentage of its purchasing power. So a state offering this, declaring it tender, and it being gold and silver, I think is the magic formula. What are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I agree completely. Uh, you know, I'm all for uh, you know people using Bitcoin and, and other things, but I think people do need to be aware of the inherent risk in those things. And you know, the thing that I say about gold and silver is that they are tangible things. You can hold it in your hand, and I know that with the uh, with the bill that's being proposed in Texas with, with this digital currency, you would have the option, if you wanted to, to trade your digital currency in for the actual metal. The metal will exist. It is something that is tangible, and you can hold that in your hand. It's a real thing. Some of these other things, eh, you know, you don't know. And the other thing is counterparty risk, which is a fancy term for basically saying that if you're in a uh, agreement with somebody, uh, whatever risk that other party has, you're basically taking on. So with the federal government, when you hold dollars, anything that the government does is a counterparty risk to you. You know, the the threat of um, devaluing that money. That's a counterparty risk. If you put your money in the bank, the bank creates counterparty risk because it could default and you might not get your money. If you have gold and silver in your hand, there's no counterparty risk. And the thing that I really like about this uh, this Texas proposal is that it's a one for one thing. If you get this digital currency, that gold will be bought, it will be stored, it will exist. There's no fractional reserve. So while there is always some counterparty risk of somebody else is holding the metal. It's much more minimal than what we see in, in a lot of these other um, other types of uh, 
currency schemes. And, and it can't be hypothecated. It can't be loaned out. It can't be right. used for any other purpose. It is separate and distinct from the state, which is important because the state has created the bullion depository and it is state backed. But under Briscoe versus Bank of Kentucky in 1837, the Supreme Court uh, put limitations uh, uh, on what you could do against a bullion depository or against a state-based bank. So it's designed with that legal uh, idea in mind because the, the, the Constitution says a state can't coin money, a state can't emit bills of credit, but a state can under Briscoe uh, and under the Constitution, which Briscoe affirmed, uh, take on deposit, hold it if it's matched one for one, ounce for ounce, so this currency won't be denominated in dollars, which used to reference a weight, but it's, we've gone from that. It'll be measured in ounces. And yes. If, and, if, and I've used this application. I've used Glent, Glent Pay, and, and it works very well. But I have to report to the IRS every transaction that yes. I do. I've got a gain or a loss. I have no privacy protection because of that. And the gold isn't kept here. It's kept in Switzerland. Right. I think the state-based is, is infinitely superior in every respect. Yeah. What I like about what is being done is that it is working within the system as it's given. We know that the, the system has been corrupted. The Constitution has been set aside in many, many ways. But we do have these things that are in place that we can use to our advantage to begin to wrest that system back and start to wrench it back toward what it was originally supposed to be. That's really what we're about at the Tenth Amendment Center, using the system as it exists, trying to restore it to what it's supposed to be. Yeah, well, money was never supposed to be a control mechanism. Money was right. supposed to be real, honest, fair, equitable, and well understood what money was. But now we've gone way beyond that. So I want to delve into the threat of central bank digital currency and how you see this, what we're proposing in Texas, being different from that sort of digital currency. <music> talking with Michael Meharry, who wrote an incredible article that got republished from Shift Gold into Zero Hedge. Got a lot of attention. I got calls from all over. Kevin, is this the thing you've been working on? The answer shortly is yes, it is exactly what we've been working on. But I want to read from the article. He said, in practice, individuals would be able to purchase digital currency from the state. The state would then use the money to purchase gold that would be held in the Texas Bullion Depository or another secure vault. Individuals would be able to redeem their digital currency for dollars or gold. The key is in making it easier to use gold in everyday transactions. The reason bad money drives out good is that government puts up barriers to using sound money in day-to-day -day life. 
That makes it more costly to spend gold and incentivizes hoarding. When you remove barriers, you level the playing field and allow gold and silver to compete head to head with Federal Reserve notes. On an even playing field, gold beats fiat money every time. Now, it used the keyword digital and people are scared because they've heard central bank digital currency and they've been told how bad it is. Is CBDC really bad and how is this different? Well, I think CBDC is really bad. It takes all of the horrible things that we've already talked about with paper money and then adds to it that government has complete control over your transactions. So they can monitor every transaction that you make and they can literally turn off your transactions if you, I don't know, you know, don't have the right social credit score or some nonsense like that. So yes, I think central bank digital currency is bad. Uh, it's, it's all of the bad of fiat with some extra bad added to it. But it's not the same as what is being proposed in Texas. It's not anywhere near the same. In the first place, central bank digital currency is exactly like a dollar. It's backed by nothing other than the government's promise uh, that, it's, that it's valuable. Uh, a gold-backed digital currency is backed by gold on a one-on-one -on -one basis, as we've already discussed. So it can't be manipulated, replicated, you know, counterfeited. It is backed by something. It is backed by real money. So in essence, it is real money. It's what paper money used to be when it was fully redeemable and backed by gold, which wasn't nearly the problem that it is today, you know, when, it was a, when there was an actual tie between gold and, and paper money. So that's the first thing. The second thing, I don't see anything in this proposal, and I've read through the full uh, proposed legislation in Texas. I don't see anything in there where they're going to be tracking, tracing, turning off, manipulating. They are obligated to return my gold or fiat money uh, if I so desire. And so it's a completely different thing. Yes, it's digital, but the digital part is not what is frightening about central bank digital currency. We use digital all the time. We shouldn't be frightened of digital. What we should be frightened of is a government, federal government backed currency that is backed by nothing. And that's the main difference that I see. I, I don't, I don't fear that the state of Texas is going to, you know, turn off my ability to transact in gold and silver because really, again, in this legal structure that's being created, they can't do it, no, uh, whereas can't. the Federal Reserve absolutely can. Yeah, and the Federal Reserve talks about it as programmable money. It's even in their documents. Uh, right. The state banking laws prohibit the state from getting involved. You'd have to have a very strong court order for them to even get involved. That's why the yeah. bullion depository is separate. And the bullion depository was protected in the original law, 2116, I guess, that's in the government code now. Um, plus, here's the other advantage, and you used the term before, competition. If Texas goes off the rails, Florida can do it better, or Oklahoma, yeah. or South Carolina. We want 50 states to do this, and then we want them to be interoperable to where they can, one, work with the other, work with the other, just like my toll tag works in Oklahoma or, or Mississippi or whatever. We want them to work together, but if one goes off the rail, goes nuts like California, then, then I'll just move my money to Texas. We, we have a saying, here, here's my saying, it used to, I'm borrowing from the great Davy Crockett who said, y'all may go to hell, I shall go to Texas. I'll say CBDC <laughs> may go to hell, my money shall go to Texas. Yeah, absolutely. And really kind of moving out and looking at the big picture, what you're talking about is exactly the foundation of what we do at the 10th Amendment Center. It's all about political decentralization. The founding generation, the biggest thing that they feared when they were ratifying the Constitution and they were debating it, the biggest fear of the anti-federalists, those who opposed ratification, was that it was going to create what they called consolidation. And that was just their fancy term of centralizing power in one government. Patrick Henry put it most succinctly. He said it would lead to the destruction of our liberties. So we want to do things that decentralize, and that's exactly what you're talking about. Fifty states doing things, competing against each other. They hold each other accountable. That's a good thing, just again, like in the market. And then ultimately, I think the biggest point we need to make is really what it ultimately comes down to is human action. We can put all of these things in place. It's useless unless people take advantage of it. So as we have the opportunity to use a gold-backed digital currency, as we have the advantage of, of buying gold and silver tax without the state sales taxes and whatnot, as these things open up, 
it's incumbent upon the people to begin taking advantage of these things. Government's not going to fix the problem for us. It's up to us to do it. We're just trying to create some structures that will make that easier for people to do. Yep. And one thing I want to make clear, you said it properly, but a lot of people hear gold backed and they think, well, if you have gold backed if you at $2,000 an ounce, so I put $2,000 in, they hold one ounce, and gold goes to $10,000 an ounce, they only hold one-fifth of an ounce. That That is one form of gold back. This is right. one for one exchange. Right. As you said, it's in ounces. Yes, exactly. So it's denominated in ounces. Well, I love what you're doing at the 10th Amendment Center. I want to mention again, the website is 10thAmendmentCenter.com. And I want to tell our viewers, if you want to learn more about how to support Texas transactional currency, go to transactionalgold.com and you can click and send a petition to the Texas lawmakers. Now, this morning I was in touch with someone in South Carolina. I've been in touch with Alaska. I'm in touch with Florida. I had lunch with uh, Governor DeSantis recently. Uh, I've been in touch with Oklahoma. The state treasurer of Oklahoma is interested in this. This is an awakening. And your article made a real difference in, in people from all over the country started calling and say, I read this, I need to know more. If we can do more of this, there should be no sales tax on money, that's ludicrous. And there yes. should be no capital gains tax on money. And, and if we can declare it tender, and we can get, uh, Governor uh, DeSanta said to me, he said, if F Florida and Texas work together, there is no one in the country that can stop them because of the power of Florida and Texas. And right. with your helping us get the word out, and with your intellectual capacity and understanding of the history of this, we welcome you to the ting team, Michael Meharry. Uh, we're so glad you've picked up on this. We'll keep you updated, and, and we'll keep all our viewers updated as we progress with this and go across the state with the Constitution. So thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you for having me. It's an honor, and I'm really appreciative of the work you guys are doing. Now, we're going to summarize all of this in our free economic battle plan. You can get a copy at economicwarroom.com. And we say it all the time. What we see as a marketplace, our enemies view as a battle space. And that could be foreign enemies like China who want to destroy the American dollar, or it could be domestic enemies who want to control you through your money. Never forget, what we see as a marketplace, our enemies view as a battle space. This is Kevin Freeman from the Economic War Room.